السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين صلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد How is everybody doing? Inshallah well Everybody is good inshallah Thank you very much for coming out Sacrificing your time, your money and your energy uh, To show support to the conference uh, As uh, our brother Abu Ismail Sa'ad mentioned We're not strangers to each other Alhamdulillah, it's been a few years And uh, it's good to see everyone once again With that being said uh, Alhamdulillah, Allah has blessed me And I'm very grateful and very humbled to be given the honor uh, to start off the conference, first and foremost. And secondly, to have a topic as paramount, as important, and as groundbreaking as anything pertaining to the Quran. Anything. Memorization of the Quran, reciting the Quran, learning the Quran, teaching the Quran. Anything pertaining to the Quran in itself is going to be the best thing to talk about and the greatest and most important thing to talk about. As the Prophet ﷺ tells us, خَيْرُكُمْ مَنْ تَعَلَّمَ الْقُرْآنِ وَعَلَّمَهُ The best of you are those who learn the Qur'an and teach it. And as uh, one of the great scholars of Islam, Ibn Abi al-Izz al-Hanafi of the 8th century, he said, إِذْ شَرَفُ الْعِلْمِ بِشَرَفِ مَعْلُومِهِ The nobility of a, of a science or a discipline is only based off of the nobility of the thing that's being studied and learned. So the nobility of the sciences of the Qur'an is because the Qur'an is the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we're talking about what Allah says in any of its phases or aspects. Translated, interpreted, increasing one's relationship, and the list goes on, and the list goes on. So I'm very grateful, and I thank the brothers for that, for giving me that, for giving me that honor. So with that being said, brothers and sisters, we have a few slides, a humble presentation that we have put together, uh, some things that came to my mind. And a few of my students helped me uh, put together and, you know, fancy up and dress it up for your eyes. subhanahu wa ta'ala. But before we get started with our uh, topic, uh, a quick fa'idah with regards to something that I mentioned in today's khutbah. And I think it's relative to this conference. And I think it's relative to each and every single Muslim, rather each and every single human being. And that is the hadith of Abdullah ibn Yasar. Who said that one day I was sitting with two of the companions of the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam. Those companions they were Sulaiman ibn Surad and Khalid ibn Urfuta. Uh, and these two companions they were out about to go to a funeral procession. They were following the funeral of someone who had died from stomach cancer. Someone who had died from a disease pertaining to his butt and his insides. Whether it's the actual belly, gastric cancer or not. Uh, and one of the companions, he said to the next companion, he says, "Alam yaqul Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, man yaqtul hu batnuhu, falan yu'adhaba fi qabrihi." He says, "Hasn't the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam told us? Hasn't the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said to us, 'Man yaqtul hu batnuhu, he who dies or is killed because of his stomach, who dies of stomach cancer, falan yu'adhaba fi qabrihi, he will not be punished in his grave. He will not be punished in his grave. So when we talk about breast cancer." We talk about prostate cancer, lung cancer. We talk about all of these different cancers that many people suffer from and are sick as we speak and die from, unfortunately. The believer should always look at things in a positive light. Always look at things in a positive light. And that is, any type of suffering and pain is a means of expiation of sin. And some of the scholars of Islam, they say that even though the hadith talks about batan, one's belly, one's stomach, one's insides, then other types of cancer as well, but Ibn Ta'ala, hopefully, will be included in this promise. It's a means of one being protected from the punishment and the torment of the grave. So we ask Allah Azza to heal all of the Muslims who are suffering from cancer, whatever the type of cancer may be, and to make them patient, and to make them of those who look forward to Allah Azza promise and His reward. With that being said, we have, first and foremost, a few introductions before we actually get into the main topic. And the first introduction is... That which says, Asma'ul Qur'an. Asma'ul Qur'an. From the things which help us strengthen and bolster our relationship with this book, is to know more about this book. And the first thing that you want to acquaint yourself with is the name and the title of a thing. And that is why Allah Azza wa Jal, He taught our forefather, our predecessor, the first man, Adam alayhi salam, the first thing that Allah taught Adam were names. 
He taught Adam the names of all things. So the foundation of any science or knowledge is the name and the title. When you meet someone, the first thing you say is your name. You introduce yourself. When you're inquiring about marrying a sister or marrying a brother, the first thing you ask is, what's the person's name? The name is very important in Islam. So therefore, what are some of the names of the Qur'an and some of the titles of the Qur'an and some of the characteristics of the Qur'an which we need to learn if we are ignorant thereof and which we need to remind ourselves if we know of them or we've heard of them but we've become a little dusty and a little rusty. And this Ibn Ayyatala will help the relationship of the Qur'an grow and it will strengthen it when you know the importance, the value, and the status of the Qur'an. So, um, these are a few benefits here from Shaykh Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahu ta'ala. He says, Faswun fi asman al-Qur'an. Al-Qur'an, al-Furqan, al-Kitab, al-Huda, al-Nur, al-Shifa, al-Bayan, al-Maw'idah, al-Rahmah, basair, al-Balaq, al-Kareem, al-Majid, al-Aziz, al-Mubarak, al-Tanzil, al-Munazzal, al-Sirat, al-Mustaqeem, hablullah, al-Dhikr, al-Dhikra, Tadkira. First and foremost, we have uh, it doesn't matter which side we start from Al Huda, the guidance, Al Kitab, the book, Al Furqan, the criterion, Al Quran, that which was recited, Al Mau'idha, the exhortation, Al Bayan, the clarification, Al Shifa, the cure, Al Nur, the light, Al Kareem, the noble and bountiful, Al Balab, the conveyance, Basair, pieces and means of insight, Al Rahma, the mercy. Al-Tanzil, the sent down book. Al-Mubarak, the blessed book. Al-Aziz, the mighty book. Al-Majid, the majestic book. Hablullah, the rope of Allah. Al-Siratul Mustaqeem, the straight path. Al-Munazzal, the revealed book. Tadhkira, the means of reminder. Al-Dhikr, the actual remembrance itself. And Al-Dhikra is the reminder itself. So everybody just stop for a brief moment, please, inshallah. And just try to soak this in. Why do I need to increase my relationship with the Qur'an? Or deeper than that, I may not even have a relationship with the Qur'an. Except for Friday, Jummah, that's it. Or except for Ramadan. Or some of us, unfortunately, the only time the Qur'an is recited is during a funeral, janazah. The whole 365 days out of the year, the Mus'haf is locked shut. And as soon as someone dies, they open it up to Surat Yasin. That's a problem. And one of the reasons why we don't have a relationship with the Qur'an, or our relationship is anorexic, it's starving, it's, it's, not, it's not healthy at all, it isn't strong, is because we are forgetful of what the Qur'an actually is. So I guarantee each and every one of these points right here, you can pick out something in your daily life that's wrong, or not going the way in which you want it to go. And you can find the answer, al balal where... Or what is the status of those who aren't Muslims? Will they go to the fire of hell? What about other faiths? Will they go to hell? Those who live in far regions who don't know the correct Islam? The Quran is balal. لِأُنْذِرَكُمْ بِهِ وَمَنْ بَلَغْ Allah says, for me to warn you with the Quran and whoever it reaches. So the answer to this da'wah problem is in the name of the Quran. Whom the Quran reaches, that's one thing. And if the Quran does not reach them, then that's something else. We have Al-Aziz, the mighty book. It's not a small book. It's not a simple book. It's not some easy book. It's a book of might and power. And everything inside the Quran is mighty and powerful and never soft and weak and apologetic. Nur, person feels blind. I feel lost. I feel depressed. I have suicidal thoughts. Read the Quran and know what's in the Quran. You can't take medicine unless you know what the medicine actually is. And that's why the capsules come on labels. This is ibuprofen. This is for anti-inflammatory. This is that. They tell you what it is so you can pop up the, the bottle and take the medicine. Moving forward. وَإِنَّهُ لَتَذْكِرَةٌ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ Allah says. وَإِنَّهُ لَتَذْكِرَةٌ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ مُصَدِّقًا لِمَا بَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ These are some of the ayat in the Qur'an. Perhaps we won't read all of them for lack of time. الْمُحَيْمِنَ عَلَيْهِ تَفْصِيلَ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ تِبْيَانًا لِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ Al-Mutashabihu Al-Mathani Al-Hakim Tilka Ayatun Kitab Al-Hakim Muhkamun Al-Mufassal Some of the other names and titles of the Qur'an And there are many of them The brothers and the sisters inshallah who read Arabic can come across them Kalam Allah, the speech of Allah Fa'ajirhu hatta yasma'a kalam Allah Al-ilm Faman hajaka fihi min ba'di man jaka min al-ilm Knowledge, the source of all knowledge Right? So, 
The point is, brothers and sisters, is that as you read the Quran, keep these things on your mind, in English and in Arabic. And if you want to really get into the sciences of the Quran and have a strong relationship, you have to learn Arabic. You have to take a small piece, a daily dose of Arabic. And it's not that difficult. Six months, 12 months, a year, two years, and inshallah ta'ala, you got it. And you keep studying and you keep working. I remember when I first started learning Quran and Arabic, I never thought or had any idea that I would be saying it and speaking it. So you never know what Allah has in store for you. Tight. With that being said, uh, there's a more uh, descriptions of the Quran, okay, hadiths about the Quran and its status and its virtue and some of the qualities of the Quran. Now let's get into points of reflection. Points of reflection. I want everyone to reflect and think about these points with regards to do I have a relationship with the Quran? And if I do, how strong or how weak is it? And also, if I don't have a relationship with the Quran, how do I establish it? How do I build it and uh, base uh, or give it more time and more energy? Moving forward. Number one, the Quran was sent down upon Muhammad and it encompasses every single human being's, or every single need human beings have. Anything that you need in this dunya and in the hereafter is in the Quran as a foundation, as a fundament. Those who know it, know it. And those who don't know it, don't know it. So just stop and think about this now. I need to make money. I need to take care of my kids. I need to get married. I need to look after my parents. I need, I need, I need, I need, I need. The first step is to go to the Quran and have a relationship with it. Reading it, understanding it, memorizing it, etc. Number two, everything about the Quran is miraculous. How it was sent down, received, memorized, spread, etc. The initial problem between someone who's a Muslim and someone who is not a Muslim with regards to explaining the Quran, is it the word of God? Did Muhammad distort it or interpret it? Was it preserved? Is you don't believe in the concept of its miraculous nature. Everything about the Quran is mu'jiz, everything about it. A man who was uneducated formally, a man who could not read and write, a man who didn't go to different lands and continents and islands, to speak so fluently, so eloquently, so confidently, so strongly, that's miraculous. The angel Jibreel came to him, that's miraculous. How he spread it, how he passed it on, that's miraculous. And every single aspect about the Quran. So just think about that. We have a Muslim in Indonesia, we have a Muslim in Tanzania, we have a Muslim in Nicaragua, Guatemala, all of them memorize, Qul hu Allahu Ahad, Allahu Samad. Lam yalid, wa lam yulad, wa lam anahad. All of them. And they speak three, four, five, six different languages, 20 dialects. But they all memorize the same surah. That's miraculous. How many people can you say have memorized your holy book or scripture? How many priests and learned scholars of your religion has memorized the entire book? I can give you a list of children, not scholars, babies that have memorized the Quran. That's miraculous. Point number three. Seeking guidance from the Qur'an Pertaining to all aspects of life and faith Number four Going back to the Qur'an for judgment We differ, we fight, we argue Let's go back to the words and the instructions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Qur'an Point number five The virtue and the superiority of the Qur'an As we've just explained Point number six Allah himself has guaranteed the protection and preservation of the Qur'an Nobody else Something could be preserved Something could be protected by a man, or by men, or by a woman, or by women. And someone who's strong, and knowledgeable, and wealthy, and trustworthy, and reliable, they could give you a guarantee. I'll take care of it. I'll protect it. I'll preserve it. That's not what Allah Azza wa said. Allah Himself promised to look after the Qur'an. Inna nahnu nazzalna dhikra wa inna lahu lahafidun. We have sent down. Not Jibreel, not Muhammad. We, Allah says, in the sense of might and honor, speaking plurally, we have sent it down. And we are the ones that's going to look after it. So the Quran has been protected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number seven, the unique qualities of the Quran, some of which we've just explained. Number eight, the obligation of seeking judgment in and from the Quran regarding all affairs. Similar to the previous point, but a bit different. Number nine, Whoever the Qur'an reaches, the proof has been established upon them, as we've just explained, that it's called Balad. Number 10, Allah's signs in the universe mentioned in the Qur'an. The planets, animals, birds, bees, fish, insects, 
human anatomy, biology, all sciences have been mentioned in the Quran directly, indirectly, specifically, generally, once or twice, or in every single surah or every single juz of the Quran. The first surah that you memorize, the first surah is was samai that's in buruj, was samai wa tariq, idha samai un shakkat, it's talking about the universe. خلق insan. He created man. That includes every single aspect of the human being. From your fingertip, to your brain, to your heart, to your liver, your kidney, your gallbladder, all of your organs. Everything about the human being. And this amazing, complex, cohesive creature called man is in the Qur'an. Number 11. How Muhammad Sallallahu conveyed and explained the Qur'an. Muhammad taught the Qur'an every single letter. And he also taught the Qur'an in its entire meaning. So he taught the Qur'an entirely. The Prophet made the entire tafsir of the Qur'an. If he didn't say it specifically, he taught the companions to say it. Like Ibn Abbas, or Zayd ibn Thabit, or Anas ibn Malik, or Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. If he didn't teach it through word, or the, 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 the spoken word, he taught it through his actions. Number 12, the categories of the people regarding their relationship and connection with the Qur'an. There are some of us, unfortunately, on the level zero. وَلَا حَوْلَ وَلَا قُوَةِ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ We have no relationship with the Qur'an at all. As the Prophet says in hadith, الَّذِي لَيْسَ فِي جَوْفِهِ أو الَّذِي لَيْسَ مَعَهُ فِي جَوْفِهِ شَيْءٌ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ كَالْبَيْتِ الْخَرِبِ He says, he who has nothing of the Qur'an in his insides is like an abandoned building. No use, no good. He's just a shell. And then there are those of us who are crawling, level one. I know a few surahs. I've been Muslim 30, 40 years, and I know a few surahs out of Juz Amma. I can barely recite the Fatiha properly. I could learn, but I didn't give the effort, the time, and energy to learn. And then there are those of us who aspire for more. I know the entire Juz Amma. I'm not a student of knowledge. I don't know Arabic. I know the entire Juz Amma. And then there are those who know Juz Tabarak. And there are those who want to keep memorizing the whole Quran. There are those who know Arabic. There are those who read the Tafsir, etc. There are those who cannot sleep at night unless they read something from the Qur'an, unless they hear something from the Qur'an. There are those who feel like fish on the deck of the ship, flapping and floundering violently, begging to be thrown back into the water. They can't breathe, they can't walk and talk unless they're connected with the Qur'an. And then there are those of us, unfortunately, when the Qur'an is recited, they may become irritated, they may become bothered, we can talk about anything, we listen to anything, but the moment the Qur'an is, I'm trying to study, I'm trying to sleep, I can't focus. And this is a reality. So there are categories of the people with regards to their relationship with this great and mighty book. Number 13. The relationship companions had with the Qur'an, the Sahaba. Similar to the previous point, but obviously much more specific. Number 14. How diligent we are or aren't regarding learning the tajweed and the tafsir of the Qur'an, as I previously explained. Every Muslim should learn the basics of tajweed. Every Muslim should know the basics of tafsir. You don't have to be a master of Ibn Kathir, but the basics. What does it mean? Alam tara kayfa fa'ala rabbuka bi ashab al What does Allah mean by this ayah? What is the importance of Surah Fil and the life of the Muslim in 2018? Your children should know who Abraha is. Li'ilafi Quraysh, they should know this. Qul a'udhu bi rabbil falaq. What's the story and the historical context behind that surah? Every Muslim should know these basics. The next point, the Quranic stories which ease and lessen the burden of any tragedy or calamity that has or is to befall the servant. So, there are brothers who have been incarcerated. There are brothers who are incarcerated. There are sisters who are incarcerated. I didn't do the crime. They franked me. It was unjust. They gave me a sentence that was unfair. Does Allah talk about incarceration in the Quran? He does. A woman has a miscarriage. She holds the baby for eight months, for nine months, and she loses the baby the, the week before she's due. Or she loses the baby after the sixth month. Or a brother and a, a, a man and a wife, a man and a woman, husband and wife, they've been trying for 30 years to have a child. And they went to the doctor, he got surgery, he did this, they can't have children. Allah talks about that in the Quran, a loss of life, loss of property, one's enemy overpower him, taking their lands, expelling them from their lands. Every calamity that can happen to a human being is mentioned in the Quran, in abundance from Yusuf to Ayyub to Musa to Isa to Muhammad to Ibrahim to Nuh and the list goes on. Those of us who are children have become lost. You pray in the masjid, you're righteous, but your son doesn't want to have anything to do with Islam. You wear full hijab, but your daughter, she doesn't want to wear hijab. She doesn't want to cover, she doesn't want to be noticed as being a Muslim at all. 
Allah tells us about the prophets and the messengers. They had fathers and they had sons that did not believe, that did not follow the path. So there's never a time in which a person who has a relationship with the Qur'an can say, I'm depressed and I, I want to commit suicide and I'm thinking about taking pills or slitting my wrists. Your relationship with the Qur'an is weak and the pills that you take to fight and stop depression are going to make you more depressed. They're going to make you more depressed and they're going to send you to another field of problems. Read the Qur'an and have a relationship with this book. Number 16 uh, is the next chapter, Faslun Fawa'idu Tadabur al Quran wa Ta'amulu Ma'anihi. The virtues of reflecting on the Quran and the fruits that you will reap, the benefits that you'll get just by thinking about the Quran, reading it, pondering over it, and reflecting thereupon. Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala he says, Wa amma ta'amulu fil Quran, fuhu tahdiqu nadir al Qalbi ila Ma'anihi. وَجَمْعٌ <تصفيق> وقال الحسن نزل القرآن ليتدبر ويعمل به فاتخذوا تلاوته عملا hmm? طيب ابن القيم he says here and as a, a faida people already know but as a reminder some of the greatest scholars who ever lived and died in history of human beings not just Muslims is no question is Ibn Taymiyyah and his people Ibn Qayyim and this is our one-two punch that we always try to bring you and provide you with in classes and in khutbas because there are some of the greatest minds and some of the greatest bodies that were ever known to man, these two men. Ibn Qayyim, he says, as far as reflecting on the Qur'an, then what does it mean? He says, It's to sharpen and to fasten and to aim your heart and the vision of the heart on the meanings of the Qur'an. To give all of your focus, all of your concentration on what the Qur'an means. Not just reciting it. Not just memorizing it. Not just hanging it on your wall or putting it on a plaque. Not just saying, I'm half it and I have ijazah and I know qira'at. There's nothing wrong with that, that's fine. But the deeper, greater aim is this. It's for you to focus on the meaning of the Qur'an and not just the wordings of the Qur'an. Ibn Qayyim he says, and this is why Allah sent the Qur'an down. Not just to be recited. Its recitation is a virtue. Its recitation is the conduit, it's the way, it's the means, the bridge to getting the meanings. But the true purpose of the Qur'an is nothing more than reflection. Nothing more than reflection. He says, Allah Azza wa tells us, this is a book which we have sent down to you, O Muhammad. And this book is Mubarak, it's blessed, full of barakah. For men to reflect and for men of intelligence and smarts to think. That's why Allah sent down the Qur'an. And Ibn Qayyim mentions many, many other ayat as well. Hassan al-Basri, he said, the Qur'an was sent down for the people to think about it and reflect on it. So therefore, use this recitation as a means of worship and to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now listen to this rule here. There's a golden principle of Ibn Qayyim, a golden principle. He says, فَلَيْسَ شَيْءٌ أَنْفَعَ لِلْعَبْدِ فِي مَعَاشِهِ وَمَعَادِهِ وَأَقْرَبِ إِلَى نَجَاتِهِ مِنْ تَدَّبُّرِ الْقُرْآنِ وَإِطَالَةَ تَأَمُّلِ فِيهِ وَجَمْعِ الْفِكْرِ عَلَى مَعْنَى آيَاتِهِ He says, listen carefully, there is nothing more beneficial for the servant there is nothing more beneficial for the Muslim, the scholar, the student of knowledge, the nine to five layman or lay woman. Nothing more beneficial pertaining to your worldly life, your children, your family, your husband, your wife, your education, your career, your lineage. وَمَعَادِهِ The grave, the angels asking you questions, the squeezing of the grave, the fitna of the grave, the adab of the grave, the blessing of the grave, resurrection, standing in front of Allah, the intercession, Jannah, etc. There's nothing more beneficial for the servant in both worlds. There's nothing closer and a greater way of him being saved and delivered than reflecting on the Qur'an. So if that's the case, I have 24 hours out of the day 
How many hours are spent on this? How much money do I spend on my, my paychecks on this? My savings on this? How much time and attention do I give to the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? When I speak, when I talk, is it with the Qur'an or is it with other than the Qur'an? Ibn Qayyim rahim wa ta'ala, he then says, and for a person to place all of his focus on the meanings of the ayat. Liman, why and how? What are you saying, Ibn Qayyim? What's the proof for this? He explains himself by saying, فَإِنَّهَا تُطْلِعُ الْعَبْدَ عَلَى مَعَاهْلِ مِنْ خَيْرِ وَالشَّرِ بِحَذَفِيرِهِمَا وَعَلَى تُرُقَاتِهِمَا وَأَسْبَابِهِمَا وَغَايَاتِهِمَا He says, and this is because the Qur'an gives the servant all guidance, all the navigation that he needs for good and for bad, for piety and for wickedness. There's nothing good except that it's mentioned in the Qur'an. And there's nothing that can possibly take place of evil and vice except that Allah has warned you in the Qur'an. He says all of the means to good, the means to evil, anything you can possibly think about is mentioned in the Qur'an. And most importantly, the final destination of the good guys and the final destination of the bad guys. The pious believers, where they want to go. And the wicked disbelievers, where they're going to go. So what is the path? What's at the end of the path? And how do I get on this path? He says the Qur'an gives you everything in general and specifically as well. Ibn Qayyim he then says, He says, He says here, and it's because when a person has a relationship with the Qur'an, it will open up the doors of treasure of happiness. The doors of the treasure chest of happiness. Every meaning of the word happiness. Everything that you do when you wake up is based around happiness. People go to work to be happy. People get married to be happy. People get divorced to be happy. People drink alcohol to be happy. People smoke drugs and put drugs until outside of their body to do nothing more but to be happy and to take their minds off of the pain, off of the pain and the suffering. People, from the time they wake up until the time they go to sleep, their initial purpose is to seek happiness. So this is the importance and the vital status of the Qur'an and its reflection. Let's move forward and summarize Ibn Qayyim's speech because it's a very, very long discussion and a very powerful essay. Uh, the last part is practical ways of bolstering one's relationship with the Qur'an. You've given us the theory, you've razzled and dazzled. Yeah, 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 okay, give me something practical. Give me something tangible. Give me something I can use in the field. First and foremost is to read. Not memorize. Not understand. Not even reflect. But just read the Quran. Open it up. Read it. In English, in Arabic, whatever language you can read. That's the first step. And that's the first practical way. And on a daily basis, each and every single Muslim should have a specific amount of Quran that he or she reads. Rain, sleep, hell, snow. Whether it's one juz, two juz, three juz, a juz after Fajr, a juz after Asr, a juz before I go to sleep, a half of a juz, a third of a juz, a page, every day have a portion of reading of the Qur'an. Not memorizing, not reviewing, but just kirah. And there's no reason why the Muslim should allow 30 days to come and go. There's no reason why the Muslim should allow the crescent moon to go to the full moon, to the half moon, to the quarter moon without at least finishing the Qur'an once. There's no reason why. If you can do it in 14 days, alhamdulillah. 10 days, alhamdulillah. 7 days, alhamdulillah. But at least once a month. Number two is to recite it. Not reading it, but recite it. Obviously, there are parallels between reading and reciting. And obviously, there are Things which aren't parallel with regards to reading and reciting. I can read without knowing the tajweed. You understand this? I can read the Qur'an in a translation, in an interpretation. But I can only recite the Qur'an in its original language. I can only recite the Qur'an with the basic tajweed. You understand this? Now this doesn't mean that you know its meanings, but the sheer act of reading it. Step number three is to memorize the Qur'an. Memorize the Qur'an. Every day I have to memorize the surah. Every day, a page out of the Mus'haf. Every day, half of a page. And when you fall off of your horse, quote unquote, you don't memorize it, you feel bad. You should feel bad. And when you don't reach a daily quota, you should feel bad. What you've memorized in an early day, 
Recite it when you pray at night. What you memorize when you're overseas, practice it when you teach people back in the United States. You have to memorize the Qur'an, and this is from the ways of having a relationship with it, in which you feel comfort with everything that pertains to the Qur'an. After that, daily application of the Qur'an's teachings, applying them to the current state of the world and, one, and one's own personal life. So when you cut on the news, or you read a newspaper, or you have a magazine, what do you see in the world today? What's going on today? People dying, people being killed, people being shot. Every day, every week in America is a shooting. One day is in Texas, one day is in California, one day is in Boston, one day is a school teacher, one day is at a club. People are just getting shot like it's nothing. What does the Quran tell us about this? About senseless violence and the shedding of blood and how one soul is sacred, preserving it and destroying it. What does the Quran teach us about this? What does the Quran tell us about politics? about countries, about leaders, about kings, about queens, about kingdoms, and about dynasties. That which goes up must come down. What does Allah Azza tell us about the Muslims when they were a minority, and when they were a majority, and any examples you can think about in the world today. But just because you focus on what's going on in the world today, it doesn't mean that you lose focus of what's going on in your household. What's going on in your house? How are your children? How do you treat your neighbors? Are you teaching the Qur'an in your house? Is the Qur'an the constitution of your house at your workplace? When you work, the money that you make, is it pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Or is it other than pleasing to Allah azza wa jal? So critically reflect and apply the teachings of the Qur'an to one's personal life and to the world as a whole. And the news and the current events that are going on in the world, what? As a whole. I guarantee, be the nice subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you follow these four steps, inshallah ta'ala, you, inshallah, will have a healthy and strong relationship with the Qur'an. Last but not least, signs of a healthy relationship with the Qur'an. How do I determine that I'm sick or well? How do I determine I'm strong or weak? How do I determine that I have a relationship or don't have a relationship? Number one, the desire to read it daily. Number two, irritation and lack of comfort when a long period of time goes by without some interaction with it. Like I said, the fish outside of the water. The fish outside of the water. The baby that's away from his or her mother. The child, the toddler, may sit for five minutes, ten minutes, two minutes, but eventually the baby's gonna cry. Where's mommy? Where's daddy? Where's Abby? Even if they're not hungry or their pamper needs to be changed, but they need to be in the comfort of their parents. And this is a metaphor that I'm trying to say with regards to how you should feel when you're not connected to the Quran. And if a day goes by and you didn't read anything, you didn't memorize anything, you didn't listen to anything, you didn't use the technology that Allah blessed you with for the Qur'an, and you don't feel bad, you have no remorse, you have no regret, then perhaps there's someone pinching a dead body. Number three, the strong desire to teach it to others. Not a desire, but the strong desire. Hey, let me teach you something from the Qur'an. Let me give you something that I learned. Let me take you on as my student. A husband teaches his wife. A wife teaches her husband. The husband is willing to listen to his young children with regards to the Qur'an. Abby, you're not reciting that properly. Whatever the case may be, be eager to teach the Qur'an and pass it on to others. Because if you love something, and if you love someone, there lies no doubt you're going to want to give it to them. It's a simple, basic, mathematic equation. One plus one equals two. I love a thing. I claim to love you. I want to share that thing with you. And if I don't share with you, and I'm not eager, then either I really don't love that thing, or I really don't what? Love you that much. Khayr inshallah, taking any disrespect or desecration towards it personally. Someone speaking about the Qur'an. Someone interpreting the Qur'an with ignorance. Someone having a burn the Qur'an day. And disrespecting and saying there's contradictions in the Qur'an. If you don't take it personally as an offense, then your relationship isn't that strong with the Qur'an. It's not okay. It's not just we differ. It's not a small thing. No, it's a major thing. Worse than you cursing my mother, cursing my father, saying how I look at my appearance, talking about the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Khayr inshallah, making it the first source of judgment and guidance, especially in times of differing and fighting. How many people go back to the Qur'an, husband and wife, they get into an argument. He raises his voice, she raises her voice, he screams, he punches the wall, she breaks a dish, she says, I don't want you, get out of my life, you never did no good for me, I'm going back to my parents' house, get out, so on and so forth. How many people actually say, hey, whoa, wait a second. The reason why I'm angry is because you violated the Qur'an. 
The reason why you're not being a good husband is because you're not implementing the Quran. The reason why we're here having this argument is because we have not read the Quran in over a year. We didn't read the Quran except for last Ramadan. We only read the Quran when we go to Juma. So how can Allah give us a harmonious marriage? Tayyip, the insatiable desire to learn more from it. You can never ever get enough. No matter if you memorize the entire Quran, you want to learn something more. You want to read something more. You want to have more secrets revealed to you from that great treasure chest. Allahumma ja'al al-Qur'an al-Rabi'a qalbi wa nura ma'sadri Oh Allah, make the Qur'an the spring of my heart and the light of my chest Dua extracted from hadith, dua to alleviate anxiety and sorrow Ahmed 1391 and Al-Albani graded it authentic Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Thank you very much for your time, for your attention and for your respect 